and welcome to our Burns Night Supper on Stories of Scotland, where we are celebrating our favourite accompaniments to haggis, which are, of course, neeps and tatties. We'll find them in history, folklore and... Fighting! That's right, it's the Battle of the Titans. Welcome to Ultimate RVW, Root Vegetable Wrestlemania. In one corner of the field, we have the mighty Tatty. Grown deep underground, this contender is known for its hard skin, dislike of the sunlight, and its ability to withstand a lot of punishment. Prepare to get mashed. And in the other corner of the field, we have the turnip. This is known for its tough flesh, which turns buttery soft after cooking, and its ability to take a lot of heat in the boiling pot. These two are going head-to-head in an epic battle to see who is the strongest accompaniment to Haggis of them all. Who will win? We don't know. What we do know is that this could make a delicious base for a Scotch broth. I'm Jenny, and I'm Team Turnip. And I'm Annie, and I'm aghast. (laughs) But I'm also in Team Tatty or Potatoes. Let's boil them, mash them, and stick them in a stew. Burns Night, which is celebrated on the 20th... I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Just do the whole episode in that accent. (laughs) Burns Night, which is celebrated on the 25th of January, is usually a time of great celebration. When groups of Scots all over the world gather and celebrate our greatest bard, Rabbi Burns. And while this is a time of converging and connecting... It's also a time of deep division, for this time of year digs up a great debate. A debate so divisive it is sure to plough deep furrows between family and friends alike. It's a time where emotions are raw and simmering tensions reach a boiling point, for this is inevitably the time when a great question gets asked. Just what is a turnip? Be careful, Jenny. You're walking into dangerous pasture here. I know, Annie, I know. And while I may get stuck in the mud, I feel like we have to settle this great British divide once and for all. Because what we Scots call a turnip, or a neep, is not actually a turnip. Jenny, weeshed you're going to get us cancelled. Look, Annie, the science doesn't lie. An actual turnip is technically a cousin of our Scottish neep, and it's commonly called a turnip or a white turnip because they have a white flesh and they're generally much smaller than what we Scots call a turnip. See, I think this is an issue of language, not of science. When I lived in England, I had a farmer friend who was really proud to show me his biggest turnip I turned up at his farmer's market so excited to see it and then I was hugely disappointed when the root vegetable he produced with the pride of a new father was not what I would call a turnip because on the inside it was white. Mm. In Scotland, turnips have a purply brown exterior and are a gorgeous pale yellow when you cut into them which transforms into a rich yellowy orange after it is cooked. Well, exactly, Annie, because this vegetable that you've just described, which has this lovely yellow colour, well, everywhere other than Scotland, it's known as a Swede, a Swedish turnip, a yellow turnip, or in North America, a rutabaga, which does seem a little left field, but rutabaga means root lump in Swedish, where the vegetable is thought to have originated. And the word turnip has its roots in Latin and translates roughly to the turned plant as though it had been carved by a wood turning into the familiar bulky ball shape that we know and love today. So I think it's called a turnip elsewhere in the world as well. Off the top of my head, Canada and Ireland. But if you do or don't call it a turnip in these countries, (laughs) write in, let me know. But then as well, I feel that people get to decide what they call their vegetables. And in my heart of hearts, I can only call this rutabaga a turnip 
That is all I know it as, and it is inscribed there, carved deeply. <laughs> I asked my papa what to call the vegetables that I think look similar to turnips, but are white inside, like I described. And he said that he only ever grew those to feed to the livestock in the winter, so he called them the cattle feed. Well, to be fair, this man knows his neeps. So I say we chuck all the science and we call this debate settled once and for all because the rest of the world is wrong. What we call a turnip is a turnip and everyone else's turnip is just cattle feet. Debate over. Now we can just get on with the episode. <laughs> Would a turnip by any other name smell so neepy? Let's start by hashing out the origin stories of these root-based heroes. Where do these incredible vegetables come from? And how did they arrive in Scotland to save our stews? The story of how the neep came to Scotland starts in 1731, with the birth of a fellow named Patrick Miller. Miller was born in Glasgow and enrolled in Glasgow University when he was just 12 years old. But before he even had time to graduate he decided he'd rather ride the wave of the booming Scottish economy and become a merchant trader. He took to the seas, trading tobacco and linen, but was struck by how severe the threat of piracy was and after a few years decided he was better off on land. With his sea legs stabilised, he went into banking. Here, he showed a natural aptitude and he worked his way up the golden pole until he was not just a leading banker in Edinburgh, but also elected to the court of the Bank of Scotland. By 1785, Miller was a very wealthy man, and he did what many very wealthy men do. He bought an estate. His estate was a few miles north of Dumfries, down in the Scottish borders, and here he made some sweeping changes to how farming was carried out, and implemented the latest advances in agriculture. For Miller was not just a banker. He had his fingers in many pies, and while agriculture was one, another was boat design. What on earth does boat design have to do with turnips? <laughs> just, I know, just wait, just wait. I promise the story of the humble neep is slowly growing as we tell Miller's tale. But first, we must talk about ships. Ever since his time on the seas as a young lad, Miller had had a fascination with ship design, specifically naval battleships. He had designed a few pieces of artillery that were in use and decided it was high time he designed an entire ship. But not just any ship. He would design a ship that was more stable and controllable than purely wind-powered ships were. A ship that had two hulls rather than one, and huge man-operated paddles that could help direct the ship when the wind wasn't cooperating. And design this ship he did. And because he was a very wealthy man, this ship didn't just live on paper, he actually built it. This ship was called the experiment, wasn't it? It was, and it was, it was very much an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, to have the money to build an experimental battleship. I mean, Annie, if that's your dream, I hate to break it to you, but I think you're in the wrong industry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the right career arc for me. From podcasting to piracy. Arr, I don't know, Annie. I could see you going from the airwaves to the actual waves. I'd listen to a podcast about it. <laughs> it certainly might be more interesting than a podcast about turnips. But hey... <laughs> yeah, true. I don't think our listeners were expecting this when they woke up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for holding on. <laughs> and Patrick Miller wasn't expecting people to care so little about his brand new battleship. You see, the British government had other plans for the future of its navy and refused to accept his ship. Dejected, Miller looked abroad to find his home for his baby battleship. And after many a navy declining the ship, he eventually gifted it to the King of Sweden. King Gustavus III of Sweden and his naval men didn't take the ship too seriously. 
In fact, they called it the British Sea Monster. But the king was a man with manners, and he sent our land-owning ship-building banker a thank you present. Miller received a most magnificent little golden snuff box, featuring a delicate ring of pearls surrounding a picture of King Gustavus III and intricate depictions of the British sea monster. But it was not the box that was the real gift, rather the contents of it. For when Miller opened it, he found it full of little seeds. He did not recognise these seeds, and he didn't know what they were, but he cultivated them in his estate's well-managed fields. And lo, when harvest time came... He pulled from the brown soils of the borders, Scotland's first neep. And the angels sing. I told you we'd get to turnips. <laughs> <laughs> you just weren't expecting to get there on a British sea monster, were you? <laughs> I certainly was not. <laughs> this explains why they're called Swedish turnips or Swedes in some countries, because they come from Sweden. Exactly. And as they are a northern cousin of Britain's more common white turnip, a.k.a. cattle feed, and they look quite similar, they adopted the name turnip and, well, we've never looked back. Well, Jenny, that's quite a tale, but it'll have to dig deep <laughs> to stand strong in the Burns Night Battle of the Root Vegetables. Ah, but I'm not done, Annie. Interestingly... The Neep is not Miller's only connection to Burns Night. For Miller was not only alive at the same time as our bard Rabbi Burns, he was also a big fan. Such a big fan that he actually joined Rabbi's Patreon in 1786 and donated him 10 guineas, about £850 in today's money. They struck up a friendship and Burns was even a tenant on one of Miller's farms for a brief period from 1788. Although, after just a few years, he decided that the farm was altogether a ruinous business, and he gave up the tenancy. But while he was there, two of his and Jean Armour's three sons were born on the farm, and his child with Helen Ann Park also lived with them there for a time. This was a very prolific time in Burns's writing career, and he wrote more than 130 poems and songs during his short time on Miller's land, including... Tam O'Shanter and Auld Lang Syne. And this was right around the same time that Miller was trading ships for seeds with the King of Swedes, and so Burns and the Turnip were both flourishing in the same spot in the Scottish borders at the very same time. I mean, that is just a weird coincidence, and it's got to get me some more haggis points. Come on. This is certainly <laughs> going to be a much closer contest than the Tatty first expected. Yes, the underdog, the neep. <laughs> <laughs> and as a nice little neep on top, when Miller died in 1815, he was buried in none other than Grey Friars Graveyard in Edinburgh, home to the ghost of bloody George Mackenzie, and of course, Grey Friars Bobby. Wow, it's like he'd been listening to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a big mausoleum sort of building as well, and I want to go and see if there's any turnips carved in the, in the stone. Rather than skulls and crossbones, it's turnips and, and roots. <laughs> Shall we bring some turnips to his grave? <laughs> turnips and the British sea monster. Talking of great British sea monsters, let's get back in the ocean, because our tatties are exceptionally well-travelled. They have got many stamps on their tatty passports. Ah, so you might say they've been on their tatty holidays. <laughs> oh, Jenny, that's a bit of a chuchter joke. It is. That's a very localised joke. Apologies for the 99% of you that didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes from the fact that in Scotland, schools would take a break in October, which was traditionally when children would help out in the fields harvesting potatoes. And although the agricultural sector now relies less on child labour, we still call that school break the tatty holidays. So, sorry, I digress, Annie. Tell me the tale of the tatty. Well, potatoes are native to the Andes region of South America, and they made it to Europe in the late 1500s. 
A few different colonizers are credited with bringing the tatty to Britain and Ireland. However, we're not quite certain when it crossed the border. When tatties first enter Scotland, likely in the 1600s, they're seen as a foreign delicacy, a new and novel foodstuff. By the early 1700s, there's accounts of potato patches forming around the big houses in Edinburgh. So the wait, so they were using potatoes decoratively or to like show off their wealth or because they wanted to have potatoes to serve to guests to show how rich they were? When I say farming around the big houses, I mean within their vegetable patches. <laughs> <laughs> I was just seeing it as like a decorative garden filled with potatoes, you know, a maze, a potato maze. (laughs) No, it's it's really just a a tatty patch, but I've tried to make it a wee bit more flowery. (laughs) (laughs) I really enjoyed looking up tatty recipes of this time period, and they are almost the same as today. It's very recognisable. Anyone with enough money for their potatoes would be clouting them in butter and having that splendid time that is buttery potatoes. (laughs) However, the potato was considered highly suspicious by a lot of people. They feared that it might bring disease or illness. See, potatoes are a part of the nightshade family of plants, which includes both delicious edible plants such as tomato, potato, aubergine... All good ingredients for moussaka... Very true, yes. But nightshades also include some plants with pretty toxic traits, such as belladonna, which was used as a poison in the ancient times. Not a great ingredient for masaka. Well, fortunately, people could see past the tatties' tough family associations. Just because it's got relatives in bad places, poisoning people and such on, doesn't mean that it's a bad plant itself. And it takes only a small amount of time for potatoes to become a meal for the people. Ah, trickle-down tatties. (laughs) Exactly that. By the mid-1700s, tatties made their route to the highlands and are embraced with well-ploughed fields and open pots. However, this boom in popularity for the potato intersects with the highland clearances. This was a time when families in the highlands and islands are forced by wealthy landlords, lairds, to move from good agricultural land to really poor quality, tiny wee patches by the coast. Because they were given much smaller pieces of land to work and to farm, the most sensible crop for them to grow was potatoes. And this is because potatoes have a high yield of calories per acre. You get a lot of potatoes out of a small patch, as anyone who's ever grown potatoes would know. A lot of bang for your muck. (laughs) It's a way to ensure you can get a good meal out of a really little bit of land. And potatoes are also relatively easy to prepare and to cook compared to some grains, which need dried and ground down before they can be made into a meal. And because of this, potatoes become a steady and stable foodstuff across Scotland. Aye. However, this is really damaging to the Highlands and Islands when the potato blight strikes in the 1840s. We have a population that has become over-dependent on one crop, the potato. Remember, it's not these people's fault that they are mostly growing potatoes. It's a result of their reduced access to good growing and grazing lands that was caused by the Highland Clearances. The potato famine has disastrous impacts across Europe. And it's particularly dreadful in rural Scotland and Ireland. Now, Ireland has a much harder time than Scotland, with significantly more starvation-related deaths. I really recommend the Irish History Podcast if you would like to learn more about the Great Famine in Ireland. I find he always puts up exceptionally well-researched material. We see famine as a kind of trend. It's a characteristic of the British Empire as a whole. And I think this tells us so much about one of the most powerful and wealthy empires of the 19th century that 
not more is done to prevent people from starving. Back in Scotland, as the potato blight hits over the mid to late 1840s, the highlands and islands are left with a hungry and broken population. Their pain and trauma of living through a famine is then weaponized against them as a reason for further clearances, for the further removal of families from their home to get them off the land completely. A great deal of the Highland and Island population move to the central belt of Scotland, to the big cities, or they emigrate to faraway places across the sea. The story of the early centuries of the potato is a real roller coaster. However, nowadays there's a robust policy on the import and export of seed potatoes, and there's actually agencies set up to support farmers in crop protection. Ryan, you don't want to mess with the potato police. They aren't potato police, Jenny. They're just the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board. Well, Annie, you don't want to mess with the Agriculture and Horticultural Development Board, let me tell you. (laughs) (laughs) You certainly don't want them to say that name more than once. (laughs) (laughs) The turnip was introduced to Scotland later than the tatty, but by the mid-19th century, it had also become a staple food across Scotland particularly for those who lived on and worked the land. Because the neep naturally evolved in the far northern hemisphere, it is well adapted to grow in wet, cold, low-light conditions. And so it was perfect for Scotland's wet, cold, low-light conditions. It's just like us, Jenny. (laughs) (laughs) But because of this resilience, it became a very reliable crop and quickly worked its way into the rotation. Watch out, tatties. There's a new root vegetable in the patch. (laughs) But what's great about neeps is that they are planted between March and June, but they can be harvested right through to the following April. And this means that neeps can happily grow over winter, providing vital, reliable sustenance in the harshest times of the year. I just want to highlight here that though you can leave your neeps in the ground all winter, they become really hard and a bit miserable. Mm. So I I harvest mine in October, November. It's still quite late. You know, you can leave them to be quite... Because isn't it, aren't they sweetest after first frost? They are indeed. That's a top tip, Jenny. Thank you. I learned it from you. <laughs> <laughs> but neeps were not just used for boiling, mashing and eating with haggis. They were also used for boiling, mashing and applying to open wounds. Because apparently, the pulpy poultice was used for drawing pus from sores. This is the worst medical advice I've ever heard. Although this may have been done in (laughs) the past, I can think of few things worse than putting a carby, starchy, sugary vegetable onto an open wound. I think you're just feeding bacteria. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you there, Annie. A slightly nicer turnip remedy was mixing turnip with sugar, and this was a common treatment for a nasty chest cold. So I'll leave you with that rather than the the other one. (laughs) Thanks, Jenny. I spent an inordinate amount of time the other night trying to find out the biggest neep that had ever been grown in Scotland. And Annie, you'll be glad to know that it was time well spent. I think we should stop doing this, Jenny. (laughs) (laughs) well jenny for once i actually trust you on this i can imagine no information more important to us right now than knowing the biggest turnip ever ever grown in scotland well hold on to your seat annie because here it comes (laughs) i'm holding on to my seat and my neeps jenny (laughs) because in november of 1951 the Kilmarnock Herald and North Ayrshire Gazette ran the headline, Turnip Story. And you'd best believe that the column was a story about a turnip. (laughs) (laughs) The article read, This is the story of a turnip, an outsize in turnips, for it weighs 27 pounds, 13 ounces. That's 12.5 kilograms. 
overgrown in Kilmars by a well-known local gardener, Mr Tannock. It was presented to a friend of his, Mr Bob Guthrie, proprietor of the hairdressing saloon in Waterloo Street, Kilmarnock. Proud of the turnip, Mr Guthrie showed it over the weekend in his window, and on Monday evening he carried it off to Hurlford, where he was due to appear in a concert on behalf of the local men's cabin. Hang on a minute there, Jenny. If I walked past a hairdresser and they had a £27 turnip in the window, I would get my hair cut even if I didn't need my hair cut, just to get close to that (laughs) turnip. (laughs) They just hold a mirror up at the back of your head and they say, is this okay? And you look at it and you just look like a turnip. (laughs) And then can we just question as well what role the turnip is playing in the concert (laughs) it's definitely lead vocals (laughs) (laughs) just using it as a bass drum (laughs) the turnip proved the centre of attraction and Mr Guthrie used it to raise some money for the cabin three pence a head was charged for guessing its weight and a sizeable sum was collected. Winner, a Mr J.M., was presented with five shillings, which he promptly handed back to swell the proceeds. What a good chap. The turnip has now found a home with Mr J. Bryson, honorary president of the men's cabin. I'm just going to jump in here that though it would be great fun to show a giant turnip all around town and bring it to your hairdresser and bring it to see a concert (laughs) i'd have limited time i think to spend with a giant turnip because very large vegetables they tend to be a bit waterlogged so you have less flavor in them so you don't really want to cook with it but at some point you've just got a really giant rotting vegetable in your life that you don't really know what to do with once it was a marvel next it is compost could you taxidermy turnips (laughs) And usually, I'm probably one of the few people in the world who can taxi turnips. (laughs) But you need to scoop out the middle and dry them. And by the time they dry, they're shrinkage. So, yeah. This is true. Annie is, like, weirdly internet famous in certain turnipy circles for her four-year-old Halloween tumshes. Yeah, Annie is queen of the taxidermy turnip. But back to the story. While this neep is a beast for sure, It is but cattle feed compared to the biggest known neep ever grown. See, the Guinness World Record for the largest neep was broken in 2011 by farmer Ian Neal from Newport. That's down in England. Ian grew a neep that tipped the scales at 85.5 pounds. That is almost 40 kilograms or over six stone. And he said that his love for growing large vegetables started three decades ago over a bet with a pal about who could grow the largest onions. (laughs) Jenny, you are the largest onion. I know, I am the prize. (laughs) I'm willing to bet you that I can grow a bigger neat than you, Jenny, even if it means we enter into 30 years of relentless competition, dedicating our lives to breaking this record... Of the biggest neep ever grown. I mean, Annie, you're on. I need a new long-term life goal, you know? My life plan only goes to next week. I need some more certainty. (laughs) (laughs) If anyone has any neep growing tips for us, please do let us know. (laughs) Perhaps to help us with our championship vegetables, I have got an exceptionally catty article from Fife about big tatties and I think I find it funny I hope you find it funny Giant potato Much noise has of late been made by some wonder-seeking mortals who have been ransacking fields and gardens for uncommon growth to such a class who we would like to disassociate ourselves from Many of them are so determined to be first place in the competition that they are willing to cheat. (gasps) They very... (laughs) Annie, please, this is serious. They very unscrupulously weigh their cabbages after being pulled up by the root 
with some pounds of earth still adhering to their roots, and their potatoes being all plastered over some inches deep with mud. We cannot celebrate the wonders of giant vegetables if they are a con, if they are but mere silly half-grown vegetables. And all I want to do is celebrate the wonders of great vegetables. <laughs> Imagine trying to fool the tatty judge with just a lump of mud. Who does that? I don't know, Annie. I would just say it would be a wonder-seeking mortal is the kind of person you want to look out for when you're guarding your tatty patch. (laughs) (laughs) Is there a way to prevent the cheating, though? Well, Annie, to guard against such errors, we have carefully washed a blue dawn potato which was dug up last week from a field on the farm of Balgoni, South Parks, which weighed four pounds and 21 ounces, and was found, after being cut up, to be completely solid. In such a potato season as the present, this is truly a novelty. Wow, what a novelty to have a nice four pound potato. Who could want more? That's a big pan of mash. <laughs> All I'm saying, Annie, is so far, my heavyweight neeps still outweigh your featherweight tatties. <sighs> well, instead of giant neeps, I have both curious and poltergeist potatoes. Mm. Now, my curious potato was grown in St. Andrews in 1915 by Mr. R. Roger. And apparently it was shaped just like a human hand. Unfortunately... They didn't put any photos of it in the newspaper I found it in. But in my head, it's pretty gnarly. Yeah, I don't think I need a photo to have nightmares about that, honestly. (laughs) Okay, so that one is curious. But what about the poltergeist potatoes? Because I'm sure I have some of them in my cupboard that I have just left in there. And they are growing wild spindly roots and definitely haunting me. Sometimes I just open the cupboard and go, oh, you're still in there, and then just close it again. (laughs) I should probably just plant them in my girlfriend's flower patch as a gift to her and just get rid of them. But, you know, they're like a little pet. I'm just amazed they're still alive. Well, beware of (laughs) opening your cursed tatty cupboard when the sun sets, because I found a few intriguing ghost stories about how the humble potato patch can become a portal between the worlds of the living and the dead. Ooh, spooky spuds. I love it. Let's hear it. So first, we've got a wee story from Bembecula about a woman who worked all hours of the day. She isn't named in the story, so let's call her Isabel. One day, as the waning light of dusk descended upon the island... Isabel stepped out from her home to tend to her potatoes in her garden. But as she made her way amongst the rows, something strange caught her eye. A figure standing at the edge of the field, shrouded in mist. There was something not quite natural about it, and she saw it changing, shifting as she drew closer. With a shock, Isabel realised it was her beloved sister, But her sister had passed away years before. This was not her sister as Isabel had known her, but rather her ghost. Isabel approached her sister who beckoned her. With the gentleness, with the tenderness, with the smile that Isabel remembered when she was alive. But her sister looked scared. And when Isabel was close enough, the ghost of her sister, long deceased leant forward and whispered a warning to her. She had come to watch over Isabel and to warn her, for in the twilight there were more malicious spirits lurking in the darkness. Indeed, as Isabel looked around, she saw suddenly all of the spectres around her plodding their way along the potato patch. Their feet were bound by unseen shackles, some with silver threads trailing from them, and others bearing heavy burdens and sacks on their backs. Her sister's ghost told her to never venture out at this hour again or to risk suffering the consequences of dealing with such malicious ghosts. The next day, when Isabel returned to check on her potatoes, 
she discovered they were all spoiled and rotten beyond saving, as if they had been touched by an icy hand. And so Isabel listened to her sister's warning. She heeded that advice, and forevermore she kept far away from her potato patch in such dangerous hours. Huh, that's a weird and dark story. What do you think the chains and shackles represented? Uh, who on the Western Isles would be put in shackles? Like like prisoners in times long gone? I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's a story with strange imagery and strange symbolism. I'm wondering if it's maybe representing the man from the Western Isles who had fought in the Jacobite Wars and never returned home, who'd maybe been locked up and killed on shore. Oh, okay. And I'm wondering if when her potatoes are rotten... This is maybe something related to the potato famine Mm. and the blight Mm -hmm. and trying to explain a supernatural cause for the failure of the potato crops. Okay, well, either way, I certainly wouldn't want a haunted potato patch. Actually, that's a lie. I would kind of love a haunted potato patch. (laughs) (laughs) But you would need to be potatoes bravos to go there at night. (laughs) Stop. (laughs) No, I wouldn't be a frized. <laughs> the tatty ghosts call them potatoes. <laughs> they are the ghosties with the roasties. <laughs> and before that ghosties any further, I have another little potato patch poltergeist story for you here. It's set in the small village of Breivik, out in the Western Isles. And there lived three brothers who were loved and respected by all. But then one of them died early. He had been taken prematurely from this life, and he left behind mourning siblings, full of sorrow. On a cold winter's night, the cook of this house, she ventured out to the garden to gather her potatoes. When suddenly, much like in the last story, this cook noticed a ghostly figure of her former employer. In terror and shock, our cook runs back home and told the other two brothers of what she had seen. Bravely, they all came forth together into the midnight air, and they saw for themselves that indeed a ghost was present in their midst. The elder brother spoke up then with courage and compassion, and he asked his deceased sibling if there was something troubling his spirit which could be put right. The ghost replied that he had broken a marriage promise and wished for forgiveness. The brothers then went to the girl who he had wronged in life and begged her clemency on behalf of their lost brother's soul. To their great relief, she welcomed his request with grace and mercy, granting him absolution in its completeness. From that day onward, no more phantoms were heard or seen in the potato patches of Breivik. Peace had been restored and the troubled spirits had been put to rest. Well, Annie, whichever one of us dies first knows to communicate to the other via the tatty phone. If I come back as a ghost, I'll creep your neeps. <laughs> We've been on quite a journey through the fields, but in the end, who has won the turnip and tatty war? You know, Annie, I've been thinking. War is no fun for any vegetable, and I think we should change this from a story of war to a tale of love. Love? That's right. Root vegetable romance. Imagine it. It's a beautiful summer's day on the Orkney Islands. And the air is filled with the sweet scent of the North Sea. The sun is shining brightly in the sky. And there's a gentle breeze that is blowing across the fields, seeming to whisper a romantic promise. Tatties and turnips were two of the most cherished vegetables in the north of Scotland. And on this day, there was one tatty, sitting in his field, who had a quiet and unassuming life. His days were spent in the mud, soaking up the sun and making sure his potato plants were healthy and strong. All he ever wanted 
was to find someone to share his life with. But he had never been very lucky when it came to love. Whilst tending his potato plants on this blue-skyed day, he noticed a turnip in the neighbouring field. He had never seen such a beautiful vegetable before, and he was instantly smitten. Our potato couldn't take his eyes off the neep, and he knew that he had to find a way to get close to his turnipy neighbour. He decided to just take a chance and ask the turnip to join him for a picnic, and to his surprise, the neep agreed. The two of them enjoyed a lovely picnic in the warm sunshine, talking and laughing. And from this one meeting, their relationship blossomed into something special. They spoke of their love for one another and of their deep desire to be together forever. The local farmer, who had been witnessing this bizarre vegetable courting, thought that it was a marvellous idea. She decided that the tatties and turnips should be united forever in the form of a new Orcadian dish. And so she plucked them both up and mashed them together with her big strong arms. And this is how Clapshot was born, and it is now a traditional meal in many a Scottish household. (laughs) I wish that more rom-coms ended with both people being picked up by a farmer, boiled, mashed, and mixed together into a paste, a delicious paste. (laughs) But it does feel like common sense to mix your tatties and your turnip together. It makes it so delicious. Especially to celebrate when you've caught a wild haggis. And if you're interested in supporting the Endangered Wild Haggis Protection Society, or rather myself and Annie, as we make this podcast, you can join our Patreon. Whilst researching this episode, I found a wonderful long fairy tale which features a creepy talking neep, a sheep with a crooked horn, and the devil. It was unfortunately too long for this episode, but I'll be popping it up on Patreon soon. So if you'd like to hear a traditional turnipy folktale while also supporting us as we make this show, you can head over to our Patreon now. Many thanks to our new patrons, Julie, Lewis, JK Pip, Sommer and Leo. Thank you. A toast to you all, close and far. Let's raise up our glasses and look to the stars. For a dinner that's hearty and made with glee, let's fill all our plates with haggis, neeps, and taddies. <laughs> we Scots are proud of our national dish. It's a meal that will fill you up maybe more than you wish. With its savoury flavour and delightful surprise, it'll bring smiles to your face with its warmth and its spice. That's right, in Scotland, pepper is considered a spice. <laughs> so though haggis may be a little bit risky, we'll toast Langeva and we'll drink some whiskey. To the joys that surround us from far and near, we can all bask in the love of neeps and tatties this year. Thank you so much for supporting us, folks. Slangeva. Slangeva. One, two, three. That sounded perfect on my end. Go me. (laughs) You're lying. You're like, don't speak to me about the claps. And so it was perfect for Scotland's wet, cold, low light conditions. It's just like us, Jenny. (laughs) I know. You know, Pauline, the first thing Pauline did today, we woke up and she looked at my arm and she went, you know, you're so pale. (laughs) I was like, leave me alone. (laughs) 